if you're seeing this video, it is because in late June of 2022, a painting of JK Rowling adorned the cover of Political Europe, accompanying an article discussing her fall from grace as a result of her public transphobia. And you may have guessed it, I did in fact create this painting. Plot twist, motherfuckers. Really buried the lead, didn't I? This video is gonna be different than any other that I've made. It's actually gonna be good. Got him. No. This video is actually gonna serve as an artist statement for my painting of JK Rowling, a person who has been actively aggressive, cruel, and villainizing of trans people over the last three years. In tweets, manifestos, and more or less an entire book. I hope to bring some clarity as to why I painted it the way I did. And I'm writing this script before this cover has gone public, but releasing it afterwards. And I'm just guessing that some people might want to know more when the cover drops. What this video won't include is any significant detailing or explanation of all the transphobic things she's done. And it won't include an analysis as to how all of her actions are dangerous. Plenty of other people have done this. Also before, I discuss the painting, I feel it's necessary to provide a warning that this video will talk a lot about transphobia, obviously, particularly transmisogyny. And I will talk about suicide, self-harm, and acts of violence and harassment. Well, I may joke to lighten these heavy topics, know that I take these subjects really seriously. It's probably also important to note that this video is entirely the expressed opinions of myself and myself only. I'm not being paid to make this. And in fact, no one at the magazine knows I am. See, I don't speak for anybody at Politico either. Okay, I hope I made that all clear. Now with that out of the way, let's get into it. I planned on laying here this entire video, but um, my back really hurts because I'm laying on the floor. So that sucks for me. I guess I'm gonna have to do something different. I feel like all the blood is rushing to my head. When I was approached by Politico to create artwork accompanying an article about JK Bowling, I did not treat the decision to take it on lightly. The requirements laid out to me, while not exactly concrete, were that it had to be a portrait of KKK Rowling and it could not be in direct conflict with the tone of the written piece. This seemed agreeable. That had done. Oh shit. The written piece was primarily going to be detailing the transphobic things Rowling has said and done, the reaction to it, and how this has warped her public image from a beloved and unimaginably wealthy author, of one of the most successful book series of all time made for children, to a slightly less beloved but still unimaginably wealthy author of one of the most successful book series of all time meant for children who also thinks trans people are the antichrist of the feminist movement and are deranged mentally ill monsters who want to eliminate and murder all women. So other than her likeness needing to be immediately readable and not straying completely away from what the article was about, it seemed like I would have some amount of freedom of how the piece was executed and the way her likeness was used. Also, I only had five days to make it. Just like all the old masters back in the 1600s. That is a joke, because oil paintings take a lot longer than five days. There's a million ways to approach creating any image, but this one posed an additional challenge. I entertained the ideas of painting her like one of the most evil characters from her own book series, or having a shadowed part of her face reveal something more sinister, or I thought about literally lighting the painting on fire, which did excite me. But it felt these initial ideas were either too on the nose to be poignant or would not create the greatest optics. It was at this point that I was firmly reminded by a friend about how careful I needed to wade through this minefield. I came to the conclusion that if I were to do something like light the painting on fire and use the charred version of the painting, while it being a successful means of portraying how I feel about her, Doing so makes it so easy for those who support her to paint me as an aggressive man enacting and inciting violence against a real woman. And not only this, but it would prove that the criticism against bowling was all indeed a witch hunt, as it has claimed to be, and I was just burning her at the stake. And that backlash would not just reflect on me, the artist, but 
the trans people who have been vocal against the hatred she makes public. My actions could be used as fodder in their alarmist hate campaign, and I did not want to further risk the demonizing of trans women just for my personal catharsis. So while I was still unsure how to convey my point of view without harming my warranted perspective in the long term, I did know that I could not be neutral in how I approached this portrait. Her hatred, constant dog whistling, and self-martyrdom as the face of cancel culture gone amok by crazy left-wing SJWs affects me and affects my community. There are real deadly consequences to her recent actions. As soon as you realize how she has continued to set an example for how to undermine the progress trans people are making for their rights across the world, and it makes her rhetoric more palatable. Even a GOP senator referenced her rhetoric while blocking a vote for the Equality Act, and Vladimir Putin advocated for the uncanceling of her. I, I don't know what other proof people need of the type of stance that she's drawing. When I began to rethink my approach, considering the damage it could cause, I had little doubts about the fact that I was going to experience the direct consequences of her actions, regardless of what I did. I expected her minions to not be pleased that a big stinky trans painted their god in an unfavorable way. And I knew that I could be the subject of anything from harassments or death threats or possible doxing by them. And while obviously I don't want this and it's not fun, I can't say that any of it necessarily scares me or deeply hurts me, even though maybe it should. And so I wanna derail and take a second to explain why I'm not fearful of the consequences of people like JK Rowling when they attack me, which I recognize sounds like overcompensation, but I want to use it as a point not only to talk about the current repercussions of being trans, but how I've experienced this same method of hate for not a dissimilar reason, and how it seemingly exists in direct contrast to the type of narrative is in JK Rowling's work. It's metaphor time, bitch. I was around 10 years old when I began to understand that I was not like anyone else around me, that I was different, and being different was a terrible thing to be. That being different could come at the cost of my family and the ones I thought cared about me not loving me anymore for the way I was. So in this fear, I retreated into myself, stayed alone in my room, remained quiet, was shoved into normality, despite knowing I did not fit into the boxes laid in front of me. All while putting the blame of why others may not love me onto myself, because surely it must be my fault. Do you get the metaphor yet? But where this metaphor begins to diverge is, I never got an acceptance letter. No one ever came to whisk me away to a better place. Things did not magically get better for me. I did not find other people who were like me, and I was not set free from my situation. I realized that I was the only one there for myself. When I confusingly came out to my best friend at age 12 as intersex, not the language that I used because I didn't have any language at the time, but ironically being intersex exists in direct opposition with the rigid binary sex ideology that JK Rowling uses to demonize trans people, but I digress. When I did this, he called me a freak and literally laughed in my face. The shame I felt for not being like other boys and feeling so confused about myself only worsened. That person and another friend began to relentlessly bully me in and out of school. It escalated to them one night creating fake AIM accounts and spending until midnight together messaging me all to try to convince me to kill myself. They harassed me and campaigned for my death because I did not fall into societal expectations of what gender should look like. They told me that I should just kill myself because I'll always be a freak and nobody will ever love me. And you know what? I almost did it because at age 12, I believed them. I sat in the sill of my open bedroom window that night and I tried to calculate whether or not if I landed directly on my head, would it be a great enough of a height to kill me? I ended up deciding that no, it probably wasn't, and it wasn't worth the risk of surviving, so I would do it in a different way on a different night. I spent the next several years planning for different ways on different nights. I endured more years of verbal, emotional, and physical 
and sexual abuse that caused deep, deep self-loathing. And after bottling my gender expression and sexuality up to avoid more hurt, I eventually cracked. I could not take pretending to be a hollowed version of myself for the ease of other people, regardless of the cost. I learned at age 12 what the repercussions of being different were. So now that I'm pushing 30, there is no way in hell I went through all of that to let somebody give me permission or denial to exist. Especially not a stranger on the internet. And especially not JK Rowling. This is why I don't react or acknowledge hate that is thrown my way against my identity. Of course, unless it's to dunk on somebody because it holds no power over me anymore. I don't care if some transphobe says I look or sound like a man here on YouTube, which I do get on every video, or calls me a deranged, mentally ill monster in my Twitter replies or whatever other feeble attempts they have to rattle my self-worth. Whatever mean thing some stranger has called me, I have called myself a thousand times as a literal child. So while I hold this self assurement and don't really care about the potential repercussions from bigots, I worried about how a negative perception could be applied to hurt those beyond just myself. I didn't want to create a tactless, overtly vilifying painting and give Terse an open door to use it as leverage to further convince those who are completely unaware about J.K. Rowling's recent metamorphosis into thinking, this painting by a trans woman is kind of mean-spirited, and that makes me think both sides have a valid point. Because I just don't like the way he, I mean, she said it. Why can't we all just get along? And on the flip side of this coin covered in human dog shit, that's right, human dog shit, I did. <laughs> I didn't want to communicate nothing at all with this portrait and do myself and other trans people a disservice with this platform by seemingly pandering to liberals with performative objectivity and make something completely milquetoast. But I am sure that the portrait I did is not strong enough of a visual message for some people and that I should have gone a lot further. Painting her as a literal monster or the devil or making her ugly or disfigured. I understand where this anger and frustration is coming from. She's a symbol for so much pain and hurt that we as trans people have endured, as well as the darkness that is seemingly constantly on the horizon. She's done harm to individual trans women by targeting them with her massive Twitter platform and has also attacked trans women as a whole group and completely undermined trans men's identities. She is a manipulative liar and she's part of a movement that pins trans people as the force of evil against the progression of women's rights. And it all fucking hurts and it's utterly vile. She stands for more than just her own image and I'm painfully aware of that. So as a preemptive response to this nature of criticism from other trans people, I will say that I don't disagree with your anger and I share it with you. But I hope this video encourages you to consider a more nuanced analysis of the piece and the optics of my choices from my position. You don't need to consider the nuances of JK Rowling because she can get bent, but just, just the artwork that I made. Believe me, my hurt, petty self, my 12 year old self wanted to paint JK Rowling as this evil being and make her into all of the horrible, ugly things she's on the inside, on the outside. But would that improve the situation? Would that jab be worth it? Somehow making her appear ugly or a monster would only reinforce that if you look different, you must be a bad person, which by the way is a thing JK Rowling loves to do in her books. As I mentioned before, I personally think that taking the low road would have just done more harm than good in this instance. But I could be wrong about that. Regardless, despite the temptation of doing something in that vein, also just doesn't really feel like my voice. If you look at all the paintings I've made in the last decade, I use abstraction and obscuration and visceral aspects of painting to create emotion and narrative. That is the language I know how to express my thoughts in. It is what I've always done, it's what I know how to do, and doing something radically different visually and conceptually would have felt really weird and unlike me. I just hope that what I put into the more abstract elements doesn't get lost in translation. All right, I think that's enough talking about 
everything surrounding the artwork itself. Now I want to talk about the painting and my specific mental and physical process behind creating it. The piece itself is done with oil paint on a wood panel and measures 12 by 16 inches. The portrait component of the art is fairly traditional and doesn't have any real strong emotion or expression, and that is on purpose. I wanted the portrait elements to appear solid and quite honestly boring, since I didn't want them to be distracting or have any one thing stand out about it because I was planning on layering it over with heavy abstraction, which I wanted to dominate the piece. Incongruent with this idea, I also wanted the negative space around her to be uniform and light to more significantly contrast the visual movement that was going to be added with the planned abstraction. I used white specifically in a way I felt represented her past and what was metaphorically behind her. Honestly, painting her portrait was not fun. I derived no pleasure from staring at Jacqueline Corn Rowling's face, and honestly, it was quite painful to do. I spent many hours over five days analyzing and recreating the representation of the type of rhetoric that has hurt me for a long time. And it was in these hours in my studio alone that I despaired about the trans kids right now who are having to grow up and figure themselves out in such a hostile world, one that does not want them to exist. I expected that I was gonna feel catharsis and empowerment from having the agency to flip the script and be the trans person who depicted the cis person for once. But honestly, it was anything but empowering. It was depressing. After I had painted the relatively normal portrait and filled in the background, it was time to bring the piece to life. But I had intended it to be completely dry before going any further, and I had specifically used mediums to speed up the drying time of the oil to prevent this specifically, but alas, it did not dry all the way and I needed to complete the piece. Fun fact, white paint typically takes the longest to dry of all the colors, just in case you are ever doing an oil painting with a white background and only have five days to do it and do the background on the fourth day. But I forgot about this fact uh, because I was very stressed. So even with a malleable background, it was time to add the main narrative component that would make this piece. I had experimented with trying to create some sort of dripping or dipped look, all of the work of Oliver Jeffers. But after testing how it would look on a blank panel, I didn't feel it was that effective to cover my whole painting in it. And I just didn't feel like I had enough control over it. Also, I knew, like I had mentioned before, that one of the defining factors of my artistic voice is that I communicate through the language of brush strokes. And when I thought about how I was gonna communicate my perspective with brush strokes, I turned to those who have also spoken in that visual language in a way that has inspired me. I thought about Francis Bacon, who is my favorite painter of all time, and is the person who inspired me to begin painting in the first place over a decade ago. And the way he unapologetically used the medium of paint to create something that was visceral and completely unique to the craft of painting. His paintings couldn't be done in any other medium. I also thought about Kathy Kollwitz, somebody who I've referenced in my personal work for many years, and who astounds me with how much her work can make you feel with so little. The subtlety expressed in the eyes of her portraits or the use of marks to imply feeling are still effective like almost a century later and speak to me on a human level. My work doesn't deserve to be even compared to theirs, but I think it's worth pointing to the masters in which I drew my inspiration from for context. I also studied what I considered some of the most important magazine covers and realized they all kind of share the same ability to create powerful narratives with very poignant subtlety that leave the viewer both understanding the issue or the subjects that they're covering while also making you want to open up the magazine and learn more. The cover of a magazine can mark a significant moment in culture or be a lens to understanding complex issues. And most importantly, that they are created by having a point of view and expressing it and understanding that objectivity is impossible as an artist. In the beginning of the abstract process, I reflected on these ideas and thought about the narrative I wanted to portray while making sure it would still be directly conveyed to the viewer. So what does the black paint mean, you ask? Well, I composed the piece to have this sort of black mass actively enveloping her. 
I wanted it to feel as if she was being overtaken by this heavy wave of darkness. The black loosely is a metaphor for her own hatred towards trans people, and this anger and vitriol towards us will eventually swallow her up as she continues to descend into radicalization. The personification of the black paint can be seen not only as the way her internal fucked up views have been externalized, but the way her actions have essentially polluted and permanently tarnished her career from the outside perspective looking inward at her. It is just a fact that she has permanently damaged her reputation. Her transphobic tirade has completely soiled both her as a person and the work that was so beloved. And it's of my opinion that she will probably either sink fully into the depths of right-wing white nationalist conservatism beyond just hating trans people until she's completely unrecognizable, or honestly, she could just straight up vanish from the public eye entirely and blame it on being canceled. The liberal JK Rowling the world thought they knew up until 2019 has been replaced with an obsessive, hateful fearmonger who attacks vulnerable people on the internet with just straight up lies and weaponizes her own pain and disgustingly uses trauma as a shield against rightful criticism in her bizarre manifestos. And while she can blame this on being canceled, all of it is no one's fault but her own. No one is forcing her to keep digging herself deeper and deeper by publicly ranting on social media and continuing to double down. And I think she's gonna keep digging with a fucking excavator. And while she might sincerely or jokingly cry cancel culture, there's a difference between being silenced or censored and having consequences to your actions. Being criticized for hate speech regardless if she thinks people are too stupid to know what she is really saying beneath the feigned concern dog whistling is, uh, that's, that's just the reality of being shitty, bro. Sorry you thought people were too dumb to see through it. The court of public opinion who cares about this, which is honestly made up of a lot of former fans of hers, have made their decision about her actions. People feel betrayed by her moral veil being ripped off considering what her career has been based on up until this point. And I think that anger is warranted. I also just want to say that no one is trying to take Harry Potter away from you, Bethany. Get a new hobby, you're like 30. As I continue to allow the black paint to encroach on her image, exactly how much of her face was going to be left was kind of a point of contention. What was the appropriate balance between having it be readable as her so you could understand the cover by just looking at it quickly? versus getting the concept across. In the end, I hope I've struck the correct balance and hopefully conveyed my point well enough through the art that those who will look at it and think about it for more than a second will be able to get it to some extent. In the end, I decided to have the black begin to cover her from both the top and bottom. I felt that having it coming toward her from all angles made it clear of how the world sees her as changed. And she will continue to be defined by her recent actions until she is completely consumed by her own hatred. In the process of making these immediate and potent brushstrokes, I thought maybe I would feel cathartic, even though I hadn't really in the portrait. But honestly, I was just angry and frustrated through all of it. None of this process was rewarding, and I'm not sure approaching it any other way would have changed that. Turns out, transphobia bad, no matter what. Uh-oh. <laughs> I know that once this cover goes public, I will have relinquished control over how it is perceived to an extent. I cannot tell people what to think or feel about it and only tell the people who watch this, I guess, even why I made it, which I hope does carry some weight to the people who do watch this. Don't yell at me, mom. Now, this is actually the first time that I've ever made something where I was like nervous about it being public. Is this what people with like emotions feel like? So I guess this is uh, the end. Thank you for watching and a special thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. I objectively love you more. If you would like to support me and the things I make, you can head over to my Patreon where I post exclusive videos all about art and I post guides and stuff like that every month. Thank you again for your continued support of me and 
what I do. Like beneath all my sarcasm and performative script reading, this stuff is like something I really care about and I really deeply think about and try hard to to make the best thing and, and make the right decisions. I love how I keep being like, I'm gonna stop making videos about negative things and then I keep making videos about negative things. Oh, it's like the world sucks. <laughs> well, good night and farewell. Until next time. Do an art.